everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, an intersection of cannabis and nutrition for the treatment of cancer patients, presented by Deborah Kimless, Medical Director for Wood Grow. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use the ask a question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kinlins. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Kaylee, and thank you to everyone at LabRoots for inviting me to speak on my two favorite subject matters, nutrition and cannabis medicine. So my journey into nutrition and cannabis medicine started off as sort of a thought question. And the question was, what if prior to beginning any medical treatment, including cannabis medicine, what if we first changed our internal milieu? What if we created an internal environment that can actually be receptive to healing? And what if that process of changing the body's internal environment is not that difficult to do? And all we had to do is change the foods that we eat. Food is known to either create or destroy health Chronic diseases are directly linked to poor eating habits. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. But what am I talking about? I'm talking about a whole food, plant-only diet, no processed foods. I'm intentionally not using the V word, vegan, because Coca-Cola and Oreo cookies and even some Pop-Tarts are vegan. I'm talking about real food found in nature, no animal products, including no eggs, no dairy, no fish, no chicken, nothing with a face, nothing that bleeds when you cut it or comes from a mother, and no processed foods, including no added oils. So what will that do? So by changing our diet to eating only plants, the body's internal environment transforms. And this transformation makes the body more receptive to healing. So why am I talking about food on a cannabis webinar? Because I want the listeners to fully understand the why and the how I treat patients before I share my case reports today. I have over 300 patients that I guide free of charge. Interestingly though, even though I'm an anesthesiologist and pain medicine doctor, the majority of my patients are cancer patients, and many of them have exhausted traditional therapeutic modalities. They were sent home to get their affairs in order and to live out the rest of their lives. So the condition for me to participate in their health care is that they must change their diet. They must check their pH every morning, and then and only then do we even consider cannabis medicine? And actually, this diet change applies to every patient I guide, whether they have cancer or not. So now we're gonna begin as to the how and the why I do this. So in medical school, we were taught that our immune system functions better in an alkaline environment than in an acid one. Well, to me, that was a pretty big statement, but it was not followed up with anything actionable. How do we make somebody's body environment of uh, alkaline pH? We have no idea how to do that. 
But as an anesthesiologist in the operating room, if somebody's blood gas came back with a low pH, there are a lot of different tricks that I could use to change it. However, life as we know it is not an operating room. And those tricks are just that. And it was only a temporary fix. So the purpose of changing our body's pH is not to be a temporary fix, but to be something permanent so that our body is ready to heal. That's why I mandate a whole food diet so that our bodies have an opportunity to heal. So I looked into the literature to see if I could support my thought experiment uh, with anything in the bench top. So interestingly, in 2012, in the Journal of Environmental Public Health, they published a survey of the literature to see what impact, if any, was the effects of an alkaline diet on health. And so they looked at a, a bunch of different benchmarks. They looked at the effect of an alkaline diet on back pain, on growth hormones, on muscle, on bone disease, and the role of pH on cell organs and membranes. So the survey looked at a whole bunch of these benchmarks and the outcomes that they found were that increased fruits and vegetables in an alkaline diet would improve a potassium sodium ratio and may benefit bone health, i.e. reduce osteopenia and osteoporosis, reduce muscle wasting, as well as mitigate other chronic diseases such as hypertension and strokes. By the way, you know, the top killers of uh, people in the United States. The resultant increase in growth hormone with an alkaline diet may improve many outcomes from cardiovascular health to memory and cognition, including Alzheimer's disease. An increase in intracellular magnesium, which is required for the function of many enzyme systems, and another added benefit for an alkaline diet. Available magnesium, which is required to activate vitamin D, would result in numerous added benefits in the vitamin D apocrine exocrine systems. Alkalinity may result in added benefit of some chemotherapy agents that require a higher pH. So all this sounds pretty interesting. So the study's conclusion, which I find very interesting after the survey is after all of these health promoting benefits, the conclusion was it would be prudent to consider an alkaline diet to reduce morbidity and mortality of chronic diseases that are plaguing our aging population. I don't know, I'm imagining that if a drug did all of these things, the language to promote this drug would be a lot stronger than using the word consider. So how do we implement a change? to create this internal alkaline environment. The most effective method is to do it by eating whole foods, no animal products, and no processed, prepackaged foods. And there continues to be a big disconnect regarding this information. So I found this two weeks ago in a magazine called The Week, and they published this little blurb linking processed foods and cancer. They shared a statistic that says that for every 10% increase in the consumption of processed foods, there's an associated 12% increase in cancer risk. Considering that most Americans predominantly eat processed foods as their daily food consumption, this statistic should be sending out warnings from every media channel Every healthcare provider should be sharing the statistic with their patients. School lunch programs should be changed, hospital foods changed. But no, I haven't seen or heard anything more than what was written here in this non-medical journal. So in additional support of pH and immune function, there was a study in April 2001 in a journal of leukocyte biology. So they were looking at the effects of extracellular pH on immune cells and showed that clinical acidosis is accompanied by immune deficiency, inflammation, and impaired immune function. And all of these things are directly linked to chronic diseases. So this is why 
I mandate that every patient check their morning urine pH to see if their pH is 7.0 or greater. The sweet spot 7.2 to 7.4, but if they're seven or greater, I'm happy with it. If their pH is not 7.0 or greater, then we try to figure out what they ate the day before that created this acid environment that hindered their body's ability to support its own immune system. In fact, I would mandate a food diary where a patient literally writes down everything they ingest so that we can go through food by food to see what is being handled properly or not properly since we're all on N of one and everybody's different. But wait, there's more. So this is an interesting study from 2005 Journal of Urology where it was reported by a study from Dean Ornish and his group where they took prostate cancer cell lines, they plated it in Petri dishes. Then they took the blood of otherwise healthy men who ate a standard American diet and dripped that blood on top of those cells growing in the Petri dish. And what they saw was not surprising. I mean, healthy men had normal or reasonably functioning immune system, so we thought. And that first column where it says SAD minus 9% shows that the blood of a standard American diet suppressed cancer growth by about 9%. And then what happened was that they put these very same men on a whole food plant-only diet for a year. And then a year later, they repeated the experiment where they took those cancer cell lines, the prostate cancer cell lines, plated them in the Petri dish, took the blood of these men, dripped it on those Petri dishes, and saw the second column under vegan, minus 70%. It showed a 70% reduction in cancer cell growth from diet alone. So not chemotherapy, not special radiation therapy, not surgery, diet alone. So then we looked at this, or they looked at um, the same type of study, this time with breast cancer cell lines, three different types. And they looked at blood of women from st who ate a standard American diet. And then two weeks worth of a whole food plant only diet. So the Black columns are the standard American diet blood, and then the hatch mark columns are the vegan blood or whole food blood that women um, who ate only vegan food for two weeks. And it showed a statistically significant difference in the reduction of breast cancer cells in three separate breast cancer cell lines in only two weeks. Now, slowing down breast cancer growth rate is exciting, but even more exciting is creating clinical cell death in breast cancer cells or something called apoptosis. So they took the same women, they did the same breast cancer cell lines, plated it out on the Petri dishes, and again, two weeks worth of a whole food plant only diet they took the blood of these women and then tested to see the kill rate of these cells. And again, the black hatch marks are the control, the women who were eating their standard American diet. And then the hatch marked columns are the same women two weeks after eating a whole food plant only diet showed again a statistically significant difference in cancer death rate Again, two weeks only of a diet change. These are compelling studies, which I share with my patients to give them uh, an understanding as to why I mandate a whole food plant only diet, especially if they have exhausted all therapeutic, traditional therapeutic modalities. But wait, there's more. Our body is made up of more microbes than human cells, known affectionately as our microbiome. The microbiome that lives in our intestines 
is actually determined by what it is fed. So you know that old adage, you are what we, what we eat? Well, that's true. But not only is that true, they are what we eat. So what does that even mean? So it means that when we eat a whole food, plant only, no processed foods, no added oil, no animals or animal derivatives, our body cultivates a microbiome that allows for microbes that are beneficial to grow. And those beneficial microbes actually secrete chemicals known as short chain fatty acids. The short chain fatty acids help to maintain the integrity of the intestinal cell junctions known as tight junctions to help prevent toxins from getting into our system. This is otherwise known as a leaky gut and that prevents inflammation and chronic illnesses. And these short chain fatty acids in and of themselves are very anti-inflammatory. When we eat a standard American diet filled with animal products, processed junk food, and processed foods that are junk but we think are good for us, we actually cultivate a microbiome that injures us. They actually secrete chemicals that distort the intestinal cell junctions, leading to systemic exposure to toxins and inflammation, which then in turn creates chronic illnesses. Um, they also secrete chemicals that are pro-inflammatory. So we actually have the power to alter the composition of our microbiome and the results of that microbiome. So we have the power to either help ourselves or hurt ourselves. So interesting, over the summer, I found this article in JAMA, and it's entitled, Starch-Based Superfoods May Protect Against a Variety of Diseases. And basically, this article summarizes the important positive aspects of short-chain fatty acids in our body. However, the conclusion of this article was a little bit different than mine. Their conclusion was, we now have to wait for a pharmaceutical company to develop a pill that contains short-chain fatty acids that would uh, confer this type of anti-inflammatory benefit. My conclusion, of course, was change the diet to a whole food plants only. So interestingly, gut bacteria can influence either positively or negatively all of these disease conditions from AIDS to diabetes, cancer, liver disease, rheumatic disease, which is uh, a term that really is a catch-all for autoimmune illnesses, inflammatory bowel diseases, chronic heart disease, kidney disease, insomnia, obesity, and autism. And when I saw this list, I couldn't help but think that it looks surprisingly like the same constellation of diseases and conditions for which medical cannabis is recommended in legal states throughout our country. And I thought, this is the introduction between nutrition and cannabis. So this is why I mandate a diet change for all of my patients. If patients are truly desperate to heal and they literally have exhausted all traditional medical treatment options and they're sick and they're dying and they've come to me, an anesthesiologist and not an oncologist, then clearly we have a serious problem and I want to give the best possible chance for successes. And obviously in life, there's no panacea. However, with the above data, I think we can all agree that it makes sense to at least try it, to implement a whole food plant only diet, make sure our pH is alkaline, to give our bodies a fighting chance to be receptive. So now we're gonna get into the, the cannabis part. Again, it was another 
thought experiment that led me to how I treat these patients. So first, before I get into it, I want to do a, a, a shout out to the endocannabinoid system. We all understand that the endocannabinoid system governs almost every single biologic system in our bodies. The purpose of it is to maintain homeostasis pretty much from every biologic system, from thinking to pooping to everything in between. But the interesting part about this is that our own endocannabinoids, our own chemicals that our body makes is made on demand, used locally, broken down quickly, and not stored. And I always thought about that a lot, actually, that if our body has this system that is this delicate balance where the chemicals that it makes are only used locally and not stored, then why would we need chemicals from a plant that are stored, that are used predominantly systemically, and that are not um, broken down rapidly, that actually almost sort of acts like a depot in our body, why would we need a lot of it? Which is how my next thought experiment came to be, which is we should be using a microdose. And so a microdose, that term microdose is really a term of art. It's not 10 to the minus six. And so I kind of want to go over what that means math-wise, and I promise this is the only mathematical part of this talk. So if we take a joint which weighs about a gram or a thousand milligrams, and let's say for ease of math's sake, we have uh, a, a cannabis cultivar that has 20% THC, that means 200 milligrams of that thousand milligram dose is, is THC. And about 30 to 40% of that, if uh, sort of literally goes up in smoke, that if you were to consume that entire dosage form by itself, by yourself, you would get about 60 to 80 total milligrams. When I'm talking about microdose, I'm talking about less than one to two milligrams. And that's just of... I'm not talking just THC, I'm talking of the entire dose that I suggest for patients. And in fact, the dose that I suggest for patients, half of it's in a raw form, half of it's in its heated form, which we'll go into in a second, um, but total dose is less than one to two milligrams. And so to substantiate this, I looked again into literature, which is not easy to find when it comes to cannabis. And in 2006, from Legrusty et al., they did a, a very similar Petri uh, test on cancer cell lines, sort of like the Petri cell, uh, the Petri uh, dish test on cancer cell lines that we discussed were using um, vegan blood. But instead of using vegan blood, they used uh, cannabis fractions, and they looked at uh, a bunch of different cancer cell lines. They plated them in Petri dishes. And then they looked at different cannabinoids and then a high THC strain and then a high CBD rich uh, strain. And then looked at the number or the amount of each of these it would take to slow down the growth of these cancer cells by 50%, also known as the IC50. And then they reported the results in micromoles, which to me was not useful. So if you used Avogadro's equation and did the conversion into milligrams, that milligram dose actually closely approximated my thoughts about the microdose. So I was substantiated. And so for the case studies I'm about to share with you, the patients all were afforded the same type of medicine they used a cannabis oil extract, a whole plant extract. Half of it was in its um, acid form or raw form. The other half was in its heated or chemically neutral form. It was a ratio of approximately 10 to 1, but the 10 to 1 THC to CBDA and THC to CBD. But the total dose 
was about 1.17 milligrams of total cannabinoid, and it was administered sublingually. So now that we have an understanding as to what and how I treat patients, I now want to discuss with you a couple of case reports. So the first is prostate cancer, and we're going to talk about two different patients. So the first is a 72-year-old man with a history of recurrent prostate cancer. He was diagnosed in 2011 with a Gleason score of 8 and a clinical state of T2B, and his PSA was 7.2. He was treated with hormone therapy and seed implant and had 25 sessions of radiation therapy. His PSA level dropped to 0.3, and he remained that way until about 2015, where his PSA started to rise to 1.0. In um, August of 2016, his PSA bumped to 7.8. A biopsy revealed recurrent cancer of the prostate, and thankfully, CAT scan showed and bone scan showed uh, no metastasis. He began his first of three uh, Lupron injections. After the first injection, a month later, his PSA remained at 7.8. He contacted me for help. We changed his diet. We started him on low-dose cannabis oil, and then he was continued on the second and third Lupron injections. And so I ask bench regarding benchmarks for every patient. Every patient's different. For this patient, his benchmark was a PSA. So the dark blue column shows um, after the first Lupron injection, the PSA at its 7.8 level. A month later, after the Lupron injection and the sublingual uh, cannabis oil and the diet change, the red shows uh, where that was introduced along with the blue, which is a Lupron injection, and the PSA dropped almost by half. The third month, he received his third Lupron injection. He continued the diet and oil, and his PSA went to 0.3. Month four, no more injections. Um, PSA down to 0.3, held steady. Month five, same thing. This was a year ago. His PSA still remains at a level of 0.1 to 0.2. He continues his oil and his um, diet. Next case, an 81-year-old otherwise healthy man with a one-year history of metastatic prostate cancer. Um, he was a hairdresser and started to recognize some low back pain and thought it was just from years of cutting hair. Workup revealed a metastatic prostate cancer. He was treated with seed implants, radiation therapy, and Lupron injections. He had an escalating testosterone level and he was on deck ready to have surgery to remove his testicles, the testosterone generating organ. So testosterone for this gentleman was the, um, his benchmark lab test. And so we changed his diet. We started him on sublingual oil five times a day. And so the first blue uh, column shows uh, a testosterone of 1350. After two weeks, his testosterone level dropped by 500 points. The surgeon said that was amazing. However, we're still gonna need surgery. He asked, could we please wait another two weeks? Two weeks later, his testosterone went to what they would have assumed would have been below surgical levels and continues to hold. So is this surprising? There are many, many studies that have shown without even a diet change, but cannabis and prostate cancer working together to create either a slowing of growth or reduction of, uh, or an increase in, in cell can cancer kills. Next case is brain cancer, and I'll share with you two patients. So an otherwise healthy 69-year-old man woke up in the emergency room after his first ever seizure, an MRI revealed a tumor and a biopsy diagnosed it as glioblastoma. His chief complaints after discharge from the hospital was extreme fatigue, 
He was unable to perform any uh, activities of daily living without assistance. And he was a, a really big man and his wife was a small person. He couldn't feed himself, he couldn't shower, couldn't dress without helping, um, had cognitive changes, couldn't speak clearly, was a loss for words. The only medicine that they put him on was Tegretol for prevention of seizures. And this is his uh, MRI pre-treatment. And so before he had an opportunity to see a doctor, he saw me, we changed his diet and started him on the microdose cannabis oil. In the first couple of days, he was able to feed himself, dress and shower and at the end of the week, he was back on his computer. He was an insurance salesman and he was closing out his accounts because this was his MRI and he didn't know what to expect. For some reason, somebody ordered another MRI. It wasn't me, but that was the result. And this is the side-by-side -side comparison. And the radiology report read as follows, uh, central cystic degeneration clearly responding to radiation therapy, except at this point, the only physician he saw was me and he did not receive radiation therapy, just a diet change and the microdose cannabis oil. And nine months later, he continued to manage the tumor in his head. Unfortunately though, he slipped and fell um, in his head and on autopsy it did show that his tumor was even smaller yet. Second patient, a 78 year old male with a diagnosis of anaplastic astrocytoma grade three. He was treated with Timidor for six months after initial diagnosis. Repeat MRI revealed a larger tumor. So the chemotherapy was changed to Lomustin Somebody um, introduced me to this patient. We started with diet change and cannabis oil two weeks after the initiation of a new chemotherapeutic agent. This was the picture of the tumor before the diet and um, chemothera the new chemotherapeutic agent and the, and the cannabis oil. After six weeks of combination, lomustin and cannabis oil treatment, MRI revealed a tumor size reduction. And also during this combination treatment, the patient reported improvement of sensorium, activity, and speech. So six weeks later, this is before and after. So is this a surprise? There are many, many studies that have shown either CBD or THC or a combination of whole plant cannabis helping to treat brain tumors. Lung cancer. So we had a 58 year old female who was a smoker who was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer in 2016 with adenocarcinoma of the lung. She underwent surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation treatment. Prior to her chemo and radiation, she saw me because she was given less than 10% chance of survival in three to five years. We changed her diet and started her on low dose cannabis oil therapy. And for her, she was the person that kept me up at night because I thought if she inhaled cannabis, that would almost act like a um, topical. And I thought that could actually be a benefit in this case, but she did not want to smoke anything because she didn't want to trigger anything that, that would have her um, return to cigarette smoking. So we continued on this sub sublingual microdose. And the benefits of this was that during the cannabis oil, she was able to endure traditional chemotherapy and radiation, which was very aggressive. She was able to maintain weight by eating. 
She didn't have uh, times where she was nauseated or vomiting. She was able to continue to do work. She was continued to do uh, her activities of daily living. And she socialized throughout her treatments to the point where her doctor was asking her what she was doing because she looked better than the people that was treating her. And she's continuing to live. This has been over a year and a half now with no recurrence of her cancer. Um, and again, there are lots of studies that have linked at least symptomatic relief of uh, chemotherapy with, uh, with cannabis oil. And so now to me, the unsung hero of cannabis treatment are topicals. And they can come in all sorts of different balms and creams and sprays. They even have bath soaks where you can sit in a tub with cannabis infused Epsom salts and uh, poultices or muds. And if you think about it, our endocannabinoid system is found everywhere, including the skin. We have nerve endings as evidenced by horrible pain when we get something as minimal as a paper cut, which means we have nerves there, therefore CB1 receptors. And that once we get that cut, our immune system is allowed to uh, help us prevent infection and promote healing. So we have CB2 receptors. So we have these receptors that are there to benefit um, using topicals. And so I wanna share with you some interesting things that I, I found with patients. One is something known as CIPN. It's chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathic pain. Over a million people have been treated with Taxol, which is one of many chemotherapy agents that creates this peripheral neuropathy. There is no FDA approved treatment. It's extremely debilitating, where people may be alive after their chemotherapy, but they're left with horrific pain. And I wanna share with you a case of a 68 year old woman who had ovarian cancer treatment. And at the time I saw her, she was unable to wear shoes because her feet were so painful. She was unable to participate in her normal affairs. She had three children who were all into sports and she couldn't get to see any of them because she couldn't walk. She was prescribed Lyrica, antidepressant medicines, anti-seizure medicines, and opiates. She did poorly with tremendous amount of side effects with the other medications. And she didn't want to try opiates because she was afraid of addiction. So we started her on a topical cream three times a day. And she was able to put on socks and shoes and see her family or children at all of its sporting events. Uh, skin cancer. So this is a patient, a 74-year-old gentleman who had actinic keratosis. It's a, a precancerous lesion. He had it surgically excised. It grew back. They put topical 5-FU, a chemotherapy agent, on it. It grew back. And so he was placed on a topical cream for six weeks. And two years later, it still looks like this. And so I hope that today's um, conversation was compelling, where we can see that there is not just an intersection between food and cannabis in health promoting ways, but actually uh, a direct connection between food and then if needed cannabis as a reasonable therapeutic options that um, can help promote and benefit health and, and prevent chronic illnesses. And now I'm ready for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinless, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. 
Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how do you begin the dosing protocol? So that's a really difficult question because everybody responds differently. But because cannabis is predominantly used systemically and is stored, I start with what I call the med in medicine, minimal effective dose. And so when I trial all of my patients with this low dose cannabis, I start really low. So I ask that even though one ml is 1.17 of total cannabinoids, I start out with uh, a quarter of an ml, 0.25, that I would administer, ha have them administer under their tongue. They hold it there for five minutes and swallow. And I do that for about three days until I slowly advance their dose. And then we follow their benchmarks, their parameters. How are they feeling? Believe it or not, in some patients, they feel some psychoactivity with that. Some pa most patients do not. And I want them to have an experience where they're not feeling psychoactivity, where they can go about their daily affairs and um, be functional while they're being treated. Great, and our second question is, does strain matter? So, more importantly than strain is what is in this strain. So I make sure that all of my patients have medicine that's tested. And when you have medicine that's tested, you understand what the cannabinoids are that are found in that particular medicine, what the terpenes are in that medicine. Everybody responds differently to different things. So the reason why strain would matter is because if one thing didn't work, something else did, but without those laboratory tests, it's sort of like shooting in the dark and not having a scorecard and understanding what worked, what didn't work, and then we move on from there. And we have time for one more question, and it says, why are most physicians and healthcare providers not discussing nutrition? That's a good question. The beauty is, is that there are many, many more doctors out there that have an understanding about the power of nutrition as I described here today. But you're right, there's a big disconnect. And that's because in medical schools and pretty much all healthcare professional schools, not only is the endocannabinoid system not taught, but really nutrition is not taught as well. But there are lots and lots of um, movies and books and different uh, information channels that are available that are out there that patients can start actually teaching doctors and their healthcare providers so that they too can understand the power of nutrition. I would like to once again thank Dr. Kimless for her presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for an on-demand viewing through June of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.